Kicking off the list at number 10, accidental science, aka the discovery of penicillin. Sometimes miracles happen when nobody's looking. Alexander Fleming first discovered penicillin back in 1928. At the time, he was actually studying Staphylococcus, which is a bacteria that causes infections, and boils, all that nasty stuff. But right before Alexander left for a two week vacation, he left a Petri dish with some of that Staphylococcus on the lab table rather than storing it away in an incubator. During this well needed time off, a penicillium mold spore just drifted in there, either through a window or the lab door, some Horton Here's a Who adventure. This tiny speck was well on its way Way, it was the perfect conditions for a spore flight. The temperature of the room wasn't too breezy, and the lack of one Alexander Fleming allowed time for the mold to fight back and prevent that bacteria from growing any further. He discovered this antibacterial substance was only produced by strains of penicillium. Yeah, the guy accidentally creates penicillin on his time off. What a great time. The 20s were an odd but brilliant time. Number nine, prohibition. It's a law that puts fear into wine drinking moms and beer drinking dads across the nation. For there was a time when the sale and consumption of alcohol was banned. That means it was a dry country, not one drop to be had. Except for those uh, found in loopholes and all the other crazy loopholes in the system. And by that, I actually mean organized crime filling the shoes of breweries and other openings like uh, literal underground bars called speakeasies to keep the sauce flowing. You know what I mean. Now, to be fair, there was an issue with drinking back in the day, but there's a few issues with banning it as well. The first being that it was in high demand, like stupid high even before it was banned. So banning it basically gave a green light to bootleggers and criminals to make millions, and they did. And second, it was America's fifth largest industry, putting many out of work and dissolving a very large portion of tax revenue. No surprise it didn't work out. Number eight, the work week. Okay, seriously, who do we have to talk to? Who do we have to blame for having to work nine to five Monday to Friday? Dolly Parton has a groovy tune about it, but when did the 40 hour work week start? Uh, 1926 is your answer. The Ford Motor Company of all companies. Yeah, who do you think? They were the first to have factory workers clock in and out 40 hours a week with a weekend. Nice. Whereas before, you maybe had one day off, maybe, depending on what you were doing. Obviously more time to rest, eat, and clear your mind, maybe work out. This increased productivity, so it spread like wildfire. Cut to today, we're now advocating for a four day work week. We're getting greedy, I know. Shorter hours, same workload, apparently this is going well. Productivity is soaring. In Iceland, for example, 2,500 workers tested this four day work week. That's literally 1% of Iceland's population, so it worked. Pretty big test run. But now 86 6% of Iceland's workforce have shorter hours. It's great. Seems like we're well on our way. So sorry, Mr. Ford. We're taking back our Fridays. Okay, number seven, Valentine's Day. Not the most romantic Valentine's Day ever, but maybe one of the most infamous. Back in 1929, organized crime was no joke. It was everywhere. Thanks to prohibition and a lot of corruption, it was the age of gangsters. However, one incident in 1929 changed things. On February 14th, 1929, seven gang members were deleted. This proved to be too much for the public at the time, and the final straw in a large string of violent crimes was up. Until this point, a lot of crooks and gangsters like Al Capone were idolized for their lavish lifestyles and ritzy and swanky nights in the town. This, however, was one step too far and helped to further reform and crime, giving a certain FBI predecessor to rise up and eventually found the FBI. The lesson here? Sure, being a gangster is great. Sign your autographs, live like a fat cat in your penthouse, but there's only so much you can get away with. After it was all said and done, Capone got put away too. And if they can get Capone, they can get you. Number six, the birth of brands. When it comes to advertisements, you can't even take the bus down the street without seeing hundreds of ads. I'll catch myself staring at a Sunwing ad for 43 minutes just so I can avoid eye contact with Johnny Jingle Keys in front of me. Even growing up, the amount of pop-ups I had to close really fast, my reflexes are so sharp now, all thanks to those gross pop-ups. And it all started 100 years ago. Huge brands began popping up in the 1920s with these fun slogans, big colorful ads. The 20s witnessed the birth of advertisements from Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, Hostess Cakes, Welch's, and of course, one of the most unforgettable, Kool-Aid. Yeah, the Kool-Aid man is 95 years old. Yeah, I bet his knees are starting to feel like glass, that's for sure. Other companies that popped at this time was CVS, the automobile industry, obviously, and two brothers in California named Walt and Roy Disney. Yeah, they had some startup cartoon studio. Not sure what happened there. Best of luck, guys, keep going. Hopefully they have a GoFundMe, maybe. Number five, 
Fear the Dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archaeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you this school hoodie were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, yeah, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then and only then do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the Apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder, go, go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, Dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh, but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more, all moving their bodies with a similar wacky frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths, that's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up, it's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was a cult, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure, either way, we're all dancing. Kicking off the list at number 10, 
the Heretic's Fork. Ah, uh, yes, I like sporks. This fork, I don't like. Another horrible thing for your neck, right off the bat, here we go. The Heretic's Fork was designed so that nobody has to physically harm the victim, which is one of the worst, in my opinion, because now it's on them to get hurt from this punishment, and then no one has to even be responsible. A double-sided medieval fork, an old rusty, horrible fork, would be attached to your neck with a belt, anything that keeps the fork steady, you name it. So now the victim has to keep their neck straight, or else the obvious and horrible what happened? Ugh, I hate it. I have a long neck too. That would be a long commute down. I don't talk about punishments enough on this channel. Some of them I don't think I'm even allowed to, to be honest. The Heretic's Fork is no joke. We could thank the Spanish Inquisition for this device, yeah. It was used from 1478 to 1834, most often to get the victim to confess to crimes. There's usually a Latin phrase on these Heretic Forks. That phrase is abiuro, translating to I recant. If you find a medieval fork in that third drawer down, and it says that in Latin, Get out of the house, that's all I'm saying. Number nine, mob football. Ah yes, some medieval footy, let's do it. Growing up, I was lousy with footwork. I couldn't kick a ball for the life of me. Back in the 12th century, I would have been doomed, would have been game over. Back in those days, it was called football because you played this game on your feet. You didn't necessarily have to use your feet to further said ball. And also the goalposts were sometimes miles away, so it made sense to use a throw or two. Also, don't stress about picking favorites for your team. Each side consisted of 300 to 500 players, so plenty of room for you and yours. I also forgot the most important rule, of course. Um, you can fight each other. Yeah, you can full on have a brawl, whatever, no rules. It comes to no surprise that there were a few casualties, but finally this game was banned come 1359. King Edward III punished those who played ball by six days of imprisonment. Yeah, it turns out when there's a bubonic plague and you're at war, maybe fighting each other and breaking bones isn't the best way to kill time. You know, maybe go and hit the archery arena. Archery arena? Go shoot some arrows. Go practice, go, go break some pots. I don't know, whatever Link does in his off time. Number eight. Don't blow it. This one rings a familiar bell. This is pretty humorous, not gonna lie. We'll lighten it up a bit. Back in the 12th century, horse racing was born in a Suffolk town called the Newmarket. Once King James I got set up in 1606, the sport became more widely known and it was now a major form of entertainment as well. Eventually, laws had to be put in place to protect said prized pupils. Those horses were famous at this point, so if you think you can walk around the streets and, I don't know, blow your nose? Think again, pal, that's illegal. Yes, it was once illegal to blow your nose in the streets because officials didn't want horses getting ill. In fact, if you were outside sick at all, you had to pay a fine if you were caught. Yeah, imagine you're on your way to the doctors while you're sick, then you get pulled over for a temperature check. You're like, oh, not today, please, oh no. Number seven, forbidden shoes. 15th century shoes, look at these fancy things, come on. Imagine you have to help carry groceries, but you could only use these. Wouldn't be done. Krakows, or pikes, these were the talk of every town. The longer the toe extended, the more wealthy you seemed. And I'm talking like six inches sometimes. See Mike's feet? That's huge. Dudes were tripping over their feet sometimes. It was crazy. Most importantly, the common folk were starting to look like royalty. Yeah, how dare you? How dare you look like the English crown, you poser? Finally, a law was passed in 1463. No knight under the rank of a lord, a squire, or gentleman, nor any other person shall wear any shoes or boots having spikes or points which exceed the length of two inches. That lasted until 1604. Yeah, God forbid you're wearing your dad's pikes and then you get busted. Too long, pal. Over two inches, go into the slammer. The punishment for a long pike was a fine of three shillings and four pence. Ah, do I have that? Oh, shoot. That's like 150 bucks today, give or take. Imagine that, all because of your shoes. All because you thought you were rich. Yeah, get a grip, peasant. Go change back in your Berks and socks. Number six, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society. It's honestly one of the worst. Because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. Here we go. Basically, this form of punishment involves a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no meaningful contact with anybody else. That's the whole punishment. Now, the isolation that solitary confinement can create can be life altering for people. It's really bad. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long that eventually they just forget about their families entirely. Some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they can no longer speak. 
Isn't that crazy? Solitary confinement and the negative effects it has on one person is becoming a wider topic of conversation today because of said effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Yeah, rightfully so. Can't mess with the brain. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was even worse. It was just a room made of stones. It was pitch black. It was freezing cold. It was also below some horrible, stinky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. No, there were some hairy creatures nibbling away at your toes, but I'll save that for the end. That's pretty, pretty horrible. All right, number five, the Great Whiskey Fire. Now, we talked about the molasses explosion. This is kind of similar, but also, I can't believe it. I love when bartenders set your drink on fire like they're magicians, like, but the Great Whiskey Fire is nowhere close to an outstanding whiskey sour dressed up in a coop. In Dublin in 1875, 5,000 barrels of whiskey were ignited and made a river of fire in the streets of Dublin. The fire started at Malone's Malt House on Chamber Street where the barrels were being stored. Once the fire touched the barrels, obviously they exploded into a whiskey lava river of death. Unless you love a hot toddy, that is. I know a hot toddy's made with rum. I just, you know, you could, you could also use whiskey. Anyways. All you could basically do was run. It was like, it set fire to everything it touched. Water, sand, gravel were all useless against it, so Captain James Robert Ingram, the head of the fire brigade, suggested horse manure, and miraculously that worked, but imagine the smell. It was the most destructive fire in the history of Dublin, and 13 people died. As terrifying as this sounds, no one died from burns or suffocation from smoke inhalation. As the city was succumbing to the fire, crowds gathered around the pool of whiskey with pots, pans, hats, and boots to collect some for themselves. The people that did die, died because they got alcohol poisoning from drinking the contaminated whiskey from the street. I shouldn't laugh at that, I'm sorry. You can't make this stuff up. It's one of the reasons Irish and whiskey go hand in hand. I mean, what? Don't drink whiskey that's a lava street covered in horse manure. Don't do that. At number four, blue eyes. The 1986 Chernobyl disaster is one of, if not the worst, nuclear disaster in history. The explosion was caused by a flawed reactor that was being operated on by inexperienced workers. The initial disaster took the lives of 31 people and almost half a million people were evacuated from the area. So many lives were affected by the disaster and the intense nuclear radiation. The firefighters who battled the fires from the explosion were some of the most affected by the radiation and it's almost unbelievable what happened to their physical appearances because of the exposure. According to records, their skin started peeling off and their eyes turned bright blue. One of the Chernobyl firefighters who was affected by the nuclear radiation had his eyes go from dark brown to light blue. He was so heavily affected by the radiation that when he was buried, he was put into a coffin sealed with zinc to counteract the radiation. All right, this one's super cute and you might die, so get ready. Number three, Sergeant Stubby. I already know this movie is gonna make me cry. Dogs, man. If dogs are in movies, I'm done. We really don't deserve dogs, okay? We don't. Sergeant Stubby was actually a real heroic doggo. While training for combat in 1917, Private Robert Conroy found a little brindle puppy with a short tail. He named him Stubby, and little did he know that he would become a decorated war hero. Stubby became their mascot for the 26th Yankee Division, 102 infantry. He learned bugle calls, the drills, and even like a little donkey salute. He would lift his right paw and just salute his head and was the only animal allowed at camp. Conroy snuck him aboard the SS Minnesota and the crew was won over by him obviously because he was so cute. How could you not? They brought him to the front lines and Stubby saved life after life. He woke soldiers during a gas attack. He rescued fallen soldiers on the battlefield by following the sound of English calls. He could distinguish the languages. He even captured an enemy spy. After this incident, he was promoted to Sergeant Stubby. Because how can you not? He captured an enemy spy. He did his job. Sergeant Stubby served and survived 17 battles, staying with Conroy even until after the war. He finally passed away in 1926, his service completed. All right, at number two, Huberta the Hippo. You've probably never heard of Huberta the Hippo, South Africa's most famous hippo, so I'm going to tell you about her and what made her so extraordinary. In 1928, Huberta the Hippo walked 1,600 kilometers or 1,000 miles, traveling from her home in the St. Lucia estuary to East London. Huberta became quite the celebrity on her journey as she drew in large crowds of people wanting to see her and give her food. Along her journey, she even 
stopped at a country club, a theater, and even the beach. After failing to capture Huberta, she was officially declared royal game, meaning no one could harm her. Sadly, however, just a month after arriving in East London, she was shot by a couple of farmers. People were so upset that these farmers harmed Huberta that they demanded their arrest. The farmers were arrested and fined 25 pounds, which was a lot back then because it was the Great Depression. Huberta's body was given to a taxidermist in London, and in 1932, Huberta's body was sent back to South Africa, where thousands of people gathered to welcome her home. Number one, last but not least, Ching Shi. I love Pirates of the Caribbean. It's my jam. Pirate. Yee. Yeah. Before I knew how bad pirates would actually smell in real life, Jack Sparrow. Loved him, but really couldn't get like six feet next to him. He would have smelled so bad. But a movie series seriously needs to be made about Ching Chi. Her story is incredible. She became known as the terror of South China due to her massive fleet of over 50 to 70,000 pirates. She started out working as a woman of the night until one night she met Cheng Yi, the pirate captain who ruled over the red flag fleet. The captain proposed to her and she said yes under the condition that they would share the power of the fleet and the plunder. Together they launched a fleet of over 1800 ships. They were highly organized, ruthless and disciplined. Sadly six years into their marriage, her husband died, leaving Ching Shi alone to rule. She ran a tight ship, handing out fierce punishments to all those who disobeyed her orders. She was strict with her prisoners, keeping her men in check should any woman be taken in. Should they take a wife? Fine, but they had to remain faithful. If they didn't, well, dead. If they took a woman against her will, dead. Any who deserted would be hunted down and tortured, then killed. The Red Fleet eventually felt like a floating country, even routinely taxing villages. The Chinese government eventually realized they couldn't defeat her. They were so scared. So instead of um, going to battle, they made a bargain. A bargain that allowed her to retire to wherever she liked with all of her riches and her uh, new bow. So it's good to be a pirate queen. Number 10, the Spanish Inquisition. Ah, yes. The Spanish Inquisition, the process of combating heresy, or as I like to call it, people not agreeing with you. See, when someone doesn't agree with me, I'll try my best to convince them otherwise. Or I'll just, I don't know, carry on living my life because what they believe is not my business. But not in Spain from 1478 to 1834, no sir. Here we have a guy called the Grand Inquisitor who was the head of the Inquisition in Spain. He was empowered by the Vatican to deal with heretics, however he deemed worthy, which seemed to be fire because there were over 2,000 burning at the stakes. More than 160,000 Jews were expelled from Spain, and those who remained, along with a heck of a lot of Muslims, were forced to convert. I could go on about how bad it was, but I got nine other points to write here. Number nine, Ottoman stole my baby. How do you create a loyal army when a bunch of your subjects don't really trust or like you very much? You go the old First Order in the new Star Wars trilogy route, and you steal children and brainwash them. Duh. If you were a Christian family living in the Ottoman controlled Balkans, Anatolia, or the Caucasus, you had to pay the blood tax. That means every four or five years, your Ottoman overlords would come along and take a male child under the age of two to be converted to Islam and then educated as soldiers to serve in the Janissary. But hey, to make up for your forced brainwashing and enrollment in a military, you were paid and you did get preferential treatment because, I mean, you don't even remember being not an Ottoman. Kinda messed up that you were used to fight against the same Christians who brought you into this world though. Number eight, Ottomans need to chill. The Ottomans were kind of the worst. Now, yes, that point of view was bolstered by the Christian parts of the world, so we can imagine they were a little biased. But when you're known for slaughtering humans to get things done, then yeah, you aren't going to be the first person invited to family dinner, you know? Two great examples of Ottomans just going that extra mile would be in 1480, when they de-lifed the city of Otranto in Italy for not converting to Islam, and in 1571, when they took the city of Famagusta and made sure every Christian who lived there didn't see the following day. The Ottoman commander did some lovely things to the Venetian commander. He said, got your nose, and uh, ears, gave him an unwanted ride around the city and presented him as a trophy to his sultan. This definitely provoked some Christian clapbacks though. Just take a look at the guy called Vlad the Impaler. Number seven, Christians need to chill too. Oh, did you think the Ottomans were the only ones out here committing atrocities? <laughs> Surprise, welcome to the real world, kiddo. European Christian rulers were not any better. You see, 
Back in the day, many rulers decided to employ mercenaries such as the Condottieri in Italy and the Landsknecht in Germany to fight their private wars for them. These mercenaries were here for one reason, money. And as such, did not go the normal warfare routes. Instead of attacking fortified positions, the condottieri would go around the countryside burning and looting. They would even bite the hand that feeds like in 1527 when 14,000 Landsknecht sacked Rome after they were not paid. The Christian mercenaries were interested in one thing, cold hard cash, and no one was safe if they didn't get it. The Landsknecht were even said to not be allowed into hell for what they did in Rome. Number six. The church is corrupt? No way! The church has always been political, but in the Renaissance it became publicly political and corrupt. There were two main families whose members became the Pope, the Medici and the Borgia, and neither one of them was too great or even followed the rules of the church. Pope Alexander Borgia VI, for example, had four children with a mistress that he continued to see while he was the Pope. One of his sons became the Archbishop of Valencia at age 17 which you won't be surprised to know is not the norm. On the Medici side of things, we have Pope Leo X, who was accused of taking part in sins like masquerade balls, selling salvation, nepotism, and excessive spending. The corruption got cleaned, but it took quite the event for that to happen. Number five, the Queen of India. So this massive and powerful empire, why is it not around anymore? I mean, in reality, we just don't do the whole empire thing anymore, unless you're Heisenberg, because he's in the empire business. But what's the main reason why they're not around anymore? Do you hear that? It's the Queen's Navy coming to shore and the boats are chock full of redcoats. Look out India, they're coming for your tea. Unfortunately for those living in India and the Mughal Empire at the time, this was sort of like the beginning of the end. As some years later, India would be brutally forced into one of the many colonies of the British Commonwealth. And yeah, did I mention brutal? Because it was pretty brutal. It wasn't the nicest of occupations the British ruled over for many, many years until a certain peace-loving Gandhi came years later and set the record straight. Number four, relatable. King Akbar of the Mughal Empire was a very notable leader, but today I'm talking about him for some other reasons. One that I can relate to personally. No, I'm not a secret king and have a palace of my own full of servants, although I mean, if you guys want to pay me, King, I'm, I wouldn't say no. I mean, it's well noted that Akbar was illiterate, which for royalty was rare back then, since that's usually the only people who can read or are allowed to read. Can't have the peasantry being too smart now. Can't have that. However, some historians suggest that his literacy isn't to blame for a lack of trying, but it's dyslexia. Yeah, that's right. It's the same reason why I hated reading as a kid. And in high school, sorry, English teachers, you can just Google Cliff Notes. It's the future. Akbar, however, did not have Cliff Notes. He had the option to hire artists to illustrate beautiful works of art in order to comprehend some things that needed visualization since he couldn't read. I did not possess such powers. However, still, still up to bait. You know, if you guys want to make me king, that's fine. I'm okay with it. Number three, cholera belts. Okay, this one is just too weird not to mention. So in the end of the Mughal Empire, there were lots of British around. That's kind of how the occupation goes. Lots of red coats and whatnot. However, it wasn't exactly an easy job for the British either. Some folks just don't like being ruled over. I wouldn't. Interesting enough though, there was also a fair share of sicknesses going around. And when you think about it, I mean, you take a whole bunch of people, mix them in with another population of a bunch of people to a place they've never been before, added with it's not the most hygienic time in history, sprinkling a little hot weather, and yeah, people are probably gonna get sick. Cholera, to be exact, cholera was a big one. So what's the solution? How do we cure this cholera? Is it, is it hand washing, hygiene? So, you know, do we keep our distance? What, what do we do? Well. The answer was cholera belts, and basically it's just a piece of red flannel fabric to wrap around your belly. That's how you cure cholera. At the time, cholera was thought to be caused by a chilly or cold belly, so warm up your belly, no more cholera. But in India where it's really hot and places like that around there in the Mughal Empire, it's kind of hot anyway, so I don't know why you need that. It doesn't really add up. Number two, diamonds. The Koh Anir diamond was literally the crown jewel of the Mughal Empire. A jewel worth more than anyone could really handle for the time, and uh, definitely today. It's too much for you. You don't want it. Too much pressure. You can never sell it. It used to be encrusted upon the Mughal throne, but after some violent disagreements, it was stolen and it passed hands, where it then went to someone else in their hands. And after that, then someone else had it. 
and then somebody else had it. And then, like a trinket your grandma tries to give you, it probably sat in her basement for a very long time before then ended up in the hands of old Blighty herself, Queen Victoria. Who else? And either of you think that's fair or not, it's been a part of the British Crown Jewels ever since. Because they take stuff, that's what they do. Number one, Anna Carley. A classic tale of love and betrayal. And maybe it actually didn't happen. Historians aren't too sure about this one. But if it is true, oh baby, what a juicy story. Anna Carley was a poor peasant, but worked her way up to becoming Akbar's wife. Uh, but she also tripped, fell, and landed in somebody else's bedroom, if you know what I mean. Naturally, Akbar was cheesed. So he did the next sensible thing and had her buried alive in the walls like Bowser did to the Toads in Mario 64. However, no amount of power stars could help us find out if she really even existed. The story of the forbidden love, however, has been retold countless times in Asian culture. I was gonna go for a Count of Monte Cristo reference that was stuck in the walls, but I feel like you guys know Mario 64 better. Pop culture beats books, right? Who reads books? Number 10, Clash of the Titans. An Avengers level threat, baby. The Titans were the big bad giants who ruled over the earth and the gods. Naturally, they all got along and there were never any problems, ever. <laughs> Yeah, right. They fought like cats and dogs, though I never understood that because all the dogs and cats I know always got along great. But the Titans fought, and, and they fought some more. Until your favorite boy Zeus had enough and kind of took control over everything. It's Zeus, it's what he does. It's too bad Aaron Yeager wasn't there to help out. Number 9, Prometheus. Poor Prometheus. This is my favorite tale from Greek mythology. I think it's rather sad for Prometheus. All he wanted to do was give us the knowledge of fire. And, and look at all the things that we did with it. Forged iron and steel, heated our homes, so no one would ever go cold again. And we cooked, which gave Gordon Ramsay 23 hit shows and a reason to curse when asking for the lamb sauce. Where's the lamb sauce? Prometheus went directly against Zeus's orders, and if you didn't know, that's kind of a bad thing. It can wind you up in a rather unfortunate position. A position like being chained up and having a large bird come feast on your intestines. Like I eat mom's spaghetti. She makes a good spaghetti, thanks mom. You make a good spaghetti. Number eight, Icarus. I think we can all relate to this one, or at least have been told a version of this when we were flush. Things were going good for us. In a nutshell, Icarus got some wax wings and gained the ability to flight. Mind you, that was probably the dream of many ancient peoples. After Icarus got his wings, he got a little arrogant. He wanted to push his wings to the limit. Kind of like Iron Man in the first Iron Man movie. But instead of falling in a multi-million dollar super suit and looking handsome while doing it, Icarus sniffed one too many of his own farts and flew too close to the sun where he burned up in it. So what's the lesson learned here, folks? Keep yourself grounded and don't sniff your own farts. <laughs> Number 7, Jason and the Argonauts. Avenger level threat acquired. For some reason in our lives, you find stories of our favorite heroes forming almighty and powerful groups. The Avengers, the Justice League, BTS. That one, that one might have too much power. But yes, Jason and the Argonauts were a band of heroes on adventures, slaying beasts, taking names, and Greekifying the area. Sadly, for Jason and the Argonauts, every time they try and make a movie about it, it just, uh, it just never worked for them, I don't know. They had a visually impressive one in the 60s and everything after that has just been a complete misfire. Hollywood, if your casting calls come my way, just, just know I make a great Jason. Look at me, I, I could be Jason. A sword, a shield, and there we go, that's it. Number six, Hercules. Hercules, Hercules, the strong one. Or the one where Danny DeVito coaches him through the process of being a Greek legend. If Danny DeVito is coaching you through anything, that probably means you're gonna come out on top. And yes, before you start typing in the comment section, technically speaking, Hercules is the Roman copy of Heracles. I know. However, it's kind of one of those things that everyone just knows the one. So anytime a Greek dude shows up with muscles, you blush and you think of Hercules. As far as Greek mythology goes, it doesn't get any more classic than a super strong guy with abs and biceps. And maybe a little bit of olive oil on him, I don't know. Number five, the League of Nations. World War I, she was a little bit of a doozy. Unlike some wars, World War I actually changed a lot after it was said and done. Borders changed, lines on maps, empires fell, some rose. Political ideas changed and the history of Europe's future was sealed the second the ink dried on the Treaty of Versailles. After the nations who were involved with the war took stock of what happened, and it was clear. 
we could never let this happen again. So the League of Nations was created. Beta UN, if you will. The idea was simple, peace, disarmament, and to step in when such horrific things were to ever happen again. I'm sure they won't. Well, the planning didn't go very well, and when it was finished, the US ultimately didn't decide to join when they were one of the founding members. Ooh. Mind you, the US had a different mindset on foreign wars back then, but they were still involved. The League dissolved shortly after the Second World War ended. Number four, flappers. What a fun word they've been. In August 1920, history was forever changed when the 19th Amendment was passed, finally giving women the right to vote. Now look, in a list of ridiculous events, I'm adding this because it took a ridiculously long time to happen. Yeah, a little twist there for you. At first you're like, what? Relax. We're working. This was post World War I when women were still working all these jobs, high paying jobs, might I add. So now there's no way they're gonna let those go. There's momentum in the workforce. So come August 1920, American women got the right to vote officially. Then Margaret Sanger came along the same year, which led us to women's right to birth control. A lot of momentum. Like Big Ched mentioned earlier, prohibition ended legal alcohol sales, but with jazz and women's independence post war on the rise, you couldn't stop all this momentum. Thus, the flapper girl was introduced to American slang. Yeah, smoking in public, drinking and dancing at jazz clubs, all things that were upsetting their Victorian lineage before them. Oh, you want to dance to jazz and have fun post war? How dare thou? You want to show your calf after working doubles during a war? How dare you? Put those caps away, put that out. Number three, the Russian Revolution. Revolution, comrades. The 1920s were a crazy time, man. And if you look at the history between the US and Russia, it's almost like a hero and a villain origin story. Okay, hear me out. World War I was a bad time for Russia. They dropped out in early 1918, shortly before the whole thing ended. Why? Because the communists were there to take over. That's just how it went. Russia went from a 300 year Romanov rule to communism within a few short years. Safe to say this was having a great effect on the already struggling nation. It seemed that the harder things got, the more communist Russia got. When looking at the states after World War I, for the most part, it was a huge financial gain. And besides being the decade of gangsters and bootleggers, this was the start of many corporations and brands, like Taylor mentioned. It seemed as things got better and became more capitalist. Interesting indeed, duality. Hmm. Number two, the Ponzi scheme. We've all heard the term Ponzi scheme at one point or another, but what does that even mean? Who is this man? Where can I find him? Ah, why are we so mad at him? Why is he scheming so often? Why, who does that? A Ponzi scheme is of course a sham of an operation. It all kicks off back in the 1920s when one Italian immigrant named Charles Ponzi moved to the United States. He arrived to the States with the same goal as anyone, to work. That's it, just to work and you know, be successful. At first he didn't have much luck, but eventually Charles was hired at Bank Zerosi. And when the bank sadly went bankrupt, Ponzi was SOL. He needed to do something and he needed to do something fast. So he dabbled into smuggling, but he got caught. After he was released, he went into the postal system, started to buy large quantities of postal coupons from countries with you know, a weak economy, and then he hired a bunch of agents, trained them up good, you know, Wolf of Wall Street style, and the whole idea was that you would promise investors that they would receive double their investment back in return within 45 days. How lovely is that? Thus, the Ponzi scheme is born. Yeah, these agents got 10% commission too, which as far as scams go, it's not too shabby. Not bad at all. Number one, Black Tuesday. Uh oh, stinky, the market crashed and now everyone's going broke. Big oof, right? Adam told me to say that, anyway. Yes, the great market crash of 29. It wasn't good. A mixture of outstanding loans, an already declining unemployment percentage, a struggling agriculture sector mixed in with a speck of low wages and stocks just not being worth what they were is the cause of the crash. By 1932, a lot of stocks were only worth 20% of what they originally were before. The stock market crash was not the main cause of the Great Depression, however, it was a symptom of it. The market wouldn't fully be back to normal until after FDR's New Deal, or realistically, when World War II had started and kicked America's, and really, the world's economy back into turbo mode. Number 10, mummification. Back in the ancient Egyptian times, of course, mummification was common. And even today, we're finding more mummies. It's pretty exciting. We're uncovering more ancient history every day. But how the hell was mummification done? Obviously, we can't talk about this in school because we're a little too young and maybe it's a little frightening. So, warning, it's a little gross. We've talked about teeth worms and trepidation, so I don't know, I feel like you're prepared. Well, for starters, mummification wasn't cheap. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. Now, it's pretty brutal, but what you would do is you would put a hook in your nose and then you would pull out your, um, 
your brains. All of the brains and the mushy stuff just right out of your head. And then you'd cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all of those goods, all those organs, gone, easy. And then while those are drying, you would put the lungs and the liver in jars. So ancient Egyptians, that's why they needed a lot of jars. You gotta put lungs and organs in it. And then you put the heart back in the body and then wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that good stuff. And then you would cover the body in salt for 70 days. Now around day 40, you would stuff in some sand and then come day 70, that's when you would wrap them finally in the mummy bandages. And then the sarcophagus finally awaits. Those jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber. So if you watch the mummy and they're, you know, making somebody a mummy and they're like moving around, no, it wasn't like that at all. It took 70 days. It was a long, exhausting process. Number nine, first open heart surgery. Okay, going back to ancient Egyptians. Why not? We're on a little track here. So they would clean the entire body out and then they would put the heart back in. Now, of course, they weren't alive during any of this, obviously. But when was the first ever open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality after this? Well, the first successful open heart surgery after mummification went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a a brawl. The surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who by the way used to be a shoemaker's assistant, he saved this man. This is how he did it. In the city's first interracial hospital too, might I add, there weren't many textbooks on this type of operations at the time. So the odds of survival here were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all, being the first. At this point in time, there were no x-rays, no antibiotics, no anesthesia, and also no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through nerves, muscles, ribs, you name it, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Now, Cornish survived, and come 1894, Williams was promoted, obviously, to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I didn't remember hearing those details in school. Probably would have fainted at my desk. Number eight, Bridget Bishop. Okay, getting some witchy nonsense for this one. Back in 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and in results, you would get covered in these sores, these pimple-like bubbles. It was really uncomfortable. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the people of Salem at first thought, oh, they're probably cursed. They're probably witches, hence why they're acting odd. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of the disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, talking nonsense. Obviously, they were extremely ill. And so the village doctor, William Greggs, just said, eh, I think they're bewitched. I think there's a couple of witches in our presence. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, you know, science, that's how it works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch and she was just cursing everybody around her. It was kind of the reason they kicked off the entire Salem witch hunt. It was all because of Bridget Bishop. Over the next few months, around 150 more folks were all convicted, all meeting their similar fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop or maybe it was just rye disease. It's now referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions. It feels like bugs are under your skin, it's horrible. But these doctors didn't know that back then. Everybody just thought they were all cursed, that they were witches. No, they were not cursed, they just needed help. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly stopped. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter. I vote the latter, me personally. Number seven, Mail and Matt's daughter. Okay, sometimes in history, humans can be found guilty of practicing witchcraft. This is wild, this was like, Imagine, imagine that today. I've mentioned Giles Corey on this list before. He's a brave soul. But we also have to mention Malin Matt's daughter. She doesn't get the light as much as Giles does. It's one thing for a town to turn against you and call you a witch, but imagine family. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow and her own daughter told everybody that she was a witch. She was the last victim of the great Swedish witch hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully the last, one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Yeah, she didn't cry out in pain. She didn't beg for forgiveness. She said all this witchy nonsense was hogwash and she stood by it too. What an OG, she was a champ, she was a badass. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury. So later she met a similar fate. You know what I'm saying? What goes around comes around like a witch flying on a broom in circles. Number six, 
wedding season. Okay, we'll brighten the mood up a little bit. We'll start going this way in ancient history. Maybe you fantasized about your own big day, right? Maybe it's a beach wedding. Maybe it's a themed wedding, like a winter wonderland. Maybe it's a nice ice palace. It's always fun, I guess. I'm Canadian, so I'm like, no, definitely, but I hear you. It's your big day, okay? Get creative. They say the best month to get married is June. And again, from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must. See, June was the month of the god Juno, and they protect women and life when it comes to marriage and childbirth. So if it's between that and Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, right? Better omens over here, for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then. So when majority of the population washed up at the end of May or the beginning of June, everybody smelt nice, right? Everyone felt good and they wanted to celebrate. So why not have weddings in this month as well, right after we have a little bubble bath or two? That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. It does make sense. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Yeah, maternity leave? Never heard of it, sorry. Welcome to ancient history. It's the worst. Number five, medieval tennis. Not to be confused with Mario Tennis, although that's probably just as hard to play, if we're being honest. Medieval Tennis was introduced in 1485, and just like the other insane ball game we covered today, this too was eventually banned. Yeah, that's how you know it's a good one. If you weren't a noble, you couldn't play tennis. You weren't allowed to. You could only play if it was Christmas. Yeah, so you better write that on your wish list. Many believe tennis was disrupting labor and encouraging violence and gambling. Yeah, tennis, encouraging violence. Imagine that. Tennis was eventually referred to as the sport of kings because both King Henry VII and VIII were actually pretty good at it. Yeah, they're like Venus and Serena Williams of medieval times, only not athletic and not nice and also not good at tennis. I mean, why else would you ban the sport, really? Let's be honest. Number four, one meal deal. Okay, so obviously food was a little sparse back in the medieval age. Uber Eats wasn't around yet, but you know what was? Disease, yeah, and, and, hor and worse things, yeah. The life expectancy wasn't great, but even so, laws were still put in place so the common folk wouldn't overindulge. Yeah, hey, I know times are rough, but uh, can you stress eat a little less? Thanks. Yeah, you just look a little gross. Yeah, King Henry VIII needs his ninth bowl of soup, so please stop. They were actually upset that the common folk were matching the lifestyle from higher ups. Nothing to do with supply, really, just appearance. In 1336, a law banned people from eating more than two courses. Soup also counted as one meal, not a sauce. Believe me, they asked. Again, the only exception here at the time, mid 1300s, was Christmas Day. Then you get to eat and have fun and play tennis. Yeah, the one day you can overindulge is the same day you can play tennis. They're like, oh, I can't. Now I can't. Number three, the thumb screw. A little less graphic, but still a horrible specific device used for punishments, dare I say. The thumb screw was used in the Middle Ages to get somebody to spill information or confess to a crime they probably didn't even commit in the first place. We didn't have anything else to detect lies, so these soldiers would make horrible devices to get you to spill the beans or lie and say you did and then we can go home. This was one of the best cases, really, the thumb screw. It was also known as the thumbkin, and it would slowly crush your fingers, obviously. Just looking at it, you're like, uh, does it do what I think it does? Yeah, it does. This, of course, turned into the knee crusher, or even worse, the head crusher, which I obviously don't need to explain. Yeah, the classic medieval fork. Now they're getting creative, advancing their gadgets. Nice, we love it. I can't even imagine the knee crusher. That alone, no thank you, let's move on. Number two, the cake test. Of all the nonsensical tests performed during the Salem witch trials that we covered in part one and two, this one takes the cake. Yeah, pun intended, I did that on purpose. It sounds delicious, but in reality, it was just spreading the disease even more. This was a popular method of seeking out witchcraft in England as well. See, they would make a cake out of, well, you guessed it, rye flour. Remember that, rye flour. And then they would add a little bit of urine from the accused witch. Yeah, I'm more of a chocolate cake guy myself. Not a big fan of urine cake. But hey, who knows? Maybe I'll change. But don't worry, nobody ate this cake, just an unfortunate village dog. Yeah, sad thing. They would feed this cake to a good boy, and then if the dog showed the same witchy symptoms, you know, being sick from said rye, then the town knew for sure that the accused was guilty. I just really wish one villager was like, maybe it's the pee. I'm just saying. Number one, rats. Another Game of Thrones classic to finish off our horrible part three. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their rats and stuff, that's great, but cover their little eyes for this one. This is horrible. Get them out of here. Rats were used as a medieval punishment. Ugh, where do I even start with this one? It was a punishment for the rats too, really. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something, and then a metal enclosure or bucket being strapped to his abs or his chest. Inside this enclosure, there are rats, 
which the strapped down person can feel walking around in their skin. And then that's when the person, and still in the punishment, begins heating the other side of the metal enclosure. And historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course, very quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. You know, many of you see where I'm going already and you're like, ooh, yep, it's gonna happen. From here, the rats begin to frantically search for a way out, the softest way out, because just like us, they have survival instincts. And the metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh, that's definitely not. Horrible, huh? Yeah, that's history. Those are the top 10 scandalous events from the Middle Ages, part three. If you want a part four, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it for you guys, that's fine. Number 10, unproud history. Blame it on my Canadian education, dyslexia, or me just being an idiot, but it took me three times to read over properly Moogle instead of Mongol. Moogle, Mongol, Moogle, Mongol. It also took me a second to realize that I'm talking about India, not Mongolia. It's okay, folks. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna drink some water and touch some grass. I'll be okay. <laughs> yes, the Mughal Empire. As it turns out, my confusion is semi-appropriate, as the Mughals were descendants of the mighty Genghis Khan, hence the Mongols. Makes a lot of sense now that you think about it. Turkic Mongols, to be exact. The Mughals were well aware of the Mongols' reputation and their history. Let's just say they weren't too proud of it. Eh, you can't blame them. However, they were more proud of their Tamir-sided heritage. Honestly. Like I said, you can't blame them. It's kind of like your dad's side of the family, you know? They're okay, but everyone likes mom's side better. That's just how it goes. Number nine, Might of Ahoms. The Galactic Empire, the NCR, and the Mughals. What do all these large organized militaries share in common? They can all be defeated by a bunch of scruffy looking ragtags who spend too much time on Mentats and in their X-Wings. All sci-fi jokes aside, the Ahoms were a tribal people who happened to live in the wrong neighborhood per se. Thing is, these guys had some serious grit. As in when dueling against the mighty Mughal Empire, they were not victorious once, twice, or three times, but a total of 17 times. 17, that's a lot. At a certain point, you've got to respect a group for kicking your butt that many times. At some point, you just got to throw in the towel and say, hey, let, let, let them keep the land. They can have it. It's theirs. I don't, I don't need it. I don't want it. Number eight, smoke. Love it or hate it. Smoking has been a part of life for a long time. Longer than you might think, actually. No, not the age of Marlboro Cowboys and ad litter telling you not to. No, hacking a dart of the past was a little bit different than getting mad at the Leafs when they're losing and you're having a break outside. Interesting enough, however, it's speculated that the hookah, or the shisha, was invented by one of the emperor's top doctors of the time. Naturally, this was something saved for the elite because, wow, well, you can't have peasantry damaging their lungs, come on. They might need those bad boys after all, with all the work they do and stuff. Number seven, science and big booms. We've come a very long way in history. Some might say too far. We've got cars, computers, and depending on who you ask, we've been to the moon. I say we have, it just makes sense. Come on guys. I mean, come on, obviously we have, because the moon is made of cheese, and that's where we get cheese, right? That's that's, where we, that's what my mom said, we get cheese from there, right? Well, there certainly was no rocket ships back then, but the scientific advancement is what is to note here. The Mughal Empire was a big contributor of the Islamic scientific revolution, as there were many contributions in math, algebra, and other useful inventions. They were one of the first to use black powder. What does that mean? Uh, besides fireworks, it means blam blams. And if you know history or anything about the time period, you know how important blam blams are. Part of the uh, black powder empires, as they're called. Number six, Taj Mahal. Husbands and wives. Marriage. Beautiful marriage. The whole sanctimony that brings lovers together. Now, I'm sure all of our viewers at home will agree in saying marriage was the best thing they ever did and absolutely not a training experience after 15 years. Right guys? Shah Jahan would agree with that. The mighty emperor who went great lengths for his beloved wife. Now I'm sure you know this story, but in case you don't, this was the man that was so heartbroken from his wife's passing, so distraught that he built the Taj Mahal. That's like your partner at home saying, you know what, babe, I love you so much. Bam, there's the Empire State Building. There it is, look at it, that's for you. The Taj Mahal is the crown jewel of Mughal architecture, and at the time cost around $1 billion with our inflation. Every year, the Taj Mahal brings thousands of tourists to witness its ivory beauty. It is a beautiful building, can't, can't lie about that, but a billion dollars? Man, she must have loved that woman, must have loved her, god damn. Number five. 
The Frontline Flora Sands We have to include this hero on our list. Flora Sands was the only British woman to fight on the front line during World War One. She was the youngest daughter of a country rector born in North Yorkshire in 1876, raised in Suffolk. She was known for being an adrenaline junkie growing up. She rode, she shot, and most of all, she was eager to leave her hometown. I get you, it's hard. She left the countryside for London and ended up working in a Cairo for a little bit. When she returned home to England, she learned how to drive, got herself a badass race car, and joined a shooting club. On her time off, she would train as a nurse too, just in case you weren't already impressed. Now, when 1914 rolled around, Flora was 38, and she immediately signed up as a volunteer to the St. John Ambulance Service and traveled to Serbia. Cut to a year later, Flora was now practically fluent in Serbian, so she transferred to the Serbian Red Cross, where she served on the front line. Because yeah. Eventually, she was pushed to fight on the field, and at this time, the Serbian army was one of the only ones that allowed women to fight. Serbia? Yeah, okay. If you can do the job, do the job. And Flora fought. She rose to sergeant major, spread the word of the Serbian army, and all that she's been able to do to help became a celebrity, basically. But during a fight in Macedonia, Flora was injured by a grenade. But did she live? She died later, but she's 80. She was like older. Oh, she was old. Okay, cool. Y you go, Flora. Mm. Number four, a fake France. How in the heck do you keep a city that has over 2,000 years of history safe from one of the worst wars the world has ever seen? Well, simple. You build a fake one. Yeah, that's right. Of course. A fake Paris. How easy. Took the Paris down the street, sans mustard. Basically a real life version of a souvenir snow globe. Now, a few months towards the end of World War I, Paris basically had a twin. The two cities of love. Military strategists were tired of seeing their beautiful city get destroyed, so they created a decoy. They built a life-size mock-up a few miles west of the actual city in order to protect it. They settled on an area just outside of the Masons Lafitte, which was nestled in the bend of the Sienne, just like Paris which is pretty neat. Today you can visit Mason's Lafitte as an upmarket retreat because even though it's a fake Paris, it can still be just as expensive. That's how they do it. They built literal carbon copies of factories, iconic pieces like the Champs, entirely empty just for show. They even set up trick lights to make it look like trains were moving at night. The French put on a full scale version of what Kevin did in his house in Home Alone. Kevin would be pretty proud. Number three, no man's land. We mentioned trench life earlier in this list, so naturally I have to expand on the patch in between trenches. No man's land. The Smithsonian says there were tales circulating around these trenches over time. Apparently, deserters lived in no man's land. What? From both sides? They were said to dig tunnels deeper and deeper and only at night would they come out to scavenge off the dead. What? These tales began around 1920 when a British cavalryman, Ardern Arthur Holm Beeman, wrote about these German prisoners who would seemingly disappear into the trenches with other deserters. His officers then told him there won't be a search party because no living man shall be sent to the ghouls among the moldering dead. That's what? That's why I couldn't, what? Poet Wilfred Owen described the land like the face of the moon, chaotic, crater ridden, uninhabitable, awful, the abode of madness. I read a book once where like a vampire lived in the world war and it was really cool. So maybe that's what this was about. Vampires are real. Number two. Sergeant Stubby. Okay, another round of let's see if Taylor cries tears of goodness this time. Cause we're talking about one amazing doggo. Sergeant Stubby was a real dog with real ambition. Oh my heart. Air Bud played basketball. Stubby saved lives, so getting dunked on, kid. He was a member of the 102 Infantry of the 26th Yankee Division. Private Robert Conroy found this little brindle puppy that he decided to call Stubby because of his short Animals weren't allowed on the base, but this doggo stole everyone's hearts, and he also took names. Yeah, he trained with them. He trekked through the barbed wire, even learned a little doggy salute. <laughs> Hit that like button. <laughs> Conroy smuggled him into the front lines, and even after he was discovered, nobody had the heart to let him go. Of course, they brought him to the front lines, and Stubby saved life after life. Real life. Okay, he was injured twice, the first time by a gas attack. After he recovered, he had a heightened sensibility towards gas, which resulted in saving dozens of fellow troops from an attack that he sensed. He rescued fallen soldiers on the battlefield following the sound of English calls, even capturing an enemy spy. After this incident, he was promoted to Sergeant Stubby. My man. ST Stubby served and survived 17 battles, staying with Conroy even after the war. He finally passed away in 1926. The service was complete. Honestly, I knew he was going to pass away, but it still hurt. Number one. 
in spy fever. I just watched James Bond the other night, it's true I did, and now I'm in spy mode. Are they out there? Is Taylor a spy? Probably, we'll never know. Probably he is. Dead letter drops were used so spies could pass on documents or money and what would happen is, you would find a hollowed out brick somewhere. It had to be public too to make it seem less spy kitty. So these spies would remove a brick from a wall, leave a note in it, put it back and just continue throughout the day. Dead letter drops weren't only bricks either, if it was indoors instead of a brick in the wall it would be a hollowed out book. Or the back plate of a mirror. This was so common that around 1914 the civilians developed something called spy fever where you were paranoid that there was a spy in your nation. Especially the early days of World War 1 people thought spies were everywhere. Make sure you check out those old thick books tonight. <laughs> Could have a tape recorder in there. Listening to you while you read Fifty Shades of Grey. Ooh, you spicy, spicy girl. Number 10, Unsinkable Sam. Have you ever had a cat kind of look you up and down like expecting something? Like that, you know? Everyone has, why? Because cats are better than you. They were worshipped in Egypt for a reason. Cats can survive on the streets for days and then come back for cuddles when they want to. The tale of Unsinkable Sam is just another reason why cats are just ridiculous. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. He started out on a German warship called the Bismarck that he snuck aboard. That blew up along with 2200 men on board, but remarkably this cat was found by the HMS Cossack on a plank of wood. So the Brits took him and then their ship was attacked. Well Sam had to figure things out once again and this time the HMS Ark Royale found him chilling once again on some debris. Finally he earned the name of Unsinkable Sam. But it wasn't over for this little dude as a few months after that the Royale was torpedoed and Sam was saved again by the HMS Legion and by his sheer badassery. Finally they brought him ashore. <laughs> Poor guy. And this seafaring adventurer retired to land and later died in 1955. I don't know how well he recovered. <laughs> Check out this picture. Number nine, interrogations. Hans Scharf was living in South Africa with his family, but when he was visiting Germany, that's when the war broke out. He was drafted, but his wife convinced a general to not put him at the front lines, but instead with the interpreters. After a handful of pleasant mistakes and wild coincidences, Hans became the lead interrogator for the Allied pilots felled in France and Germany. His methods, though, changed history in a good way. When he was younger, he witnessed a prisoner get abused, so from that day on, he vowed to never do the same. So his interrogation methods revolved around using kindness and friendly banter. His method had been studied since, and it works even better, of course. This way, whoever's on the other side, they leak more information, and nobody has to break any fingers. Once the war was over, Scharf testified against Germans, moved to the States, and began a new career as a mosaic artist. His work is currently on display right now in Cinderella's castle at Disney World. So if you want to Take a good look. Go and buy a $90 ticket and look. Number eight, the limping lady. Her name, Virginia Hall. Permission to take down the Third Reich. Athletic, sharp, and funny, fluent in German, Italian, French, and a little Russian, Hall had all the makings to be a perfect spy. Born in Baltimore, Maryland to a wealthy family, she had no limits on where she would go, except for this. She applied to the US Foreign Service twice and was denied both times, firstly because she was a woman, and the second time because she was a woman and a cripple. She had accidentally mangled her left foot and had replaced it with a wooden prosthetic, hence the later name, The Limping Lady. She moved to Paris and one night at a cocktail bar she was rallying against the evil German leader when a woman handed her a card. The woman was none other than Vera Atkins, a British spy master believed to be Ian Fleming's inspiration for Miss Moneypenny and James Bond. Throughout the war, Hall was dubbed the most dangerous spy on the Allied force by the Germans. They hated her. Through guerrilla tactics, expert stealth communication, and disguise, she quickly became a legend. After the war, Hall was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, one of the highest US military honors for bravery in combat. Take that, Secret Service. Number seven, Operation Gunnerside. This next one should be a movie. It's already a movie? Damn it. Okay, back in 1943, the Germans were up to some things. We can't say certain words because of YouTube's stuff, but you get me, they were busy. In the early 40s, Germany took over a factory in Telemark so they could make plutonium. Originally, the Allies sent 30 British Army officers, but they couldn't make it due to weather conditions. So next, they sent 11 Norwegians with skis. That's apparently all it takes to sabotage the plant. This is amazing, okay. The Norwegians snuck down a 660-foot ice gorge, snuck in, laid a bunch of explosives, waited for their hot 
hostage to find his glasses. He was a Norwegian caretaker. They let him go afterwards. Zero casualties in this entire mission, by the way. And then they left on skis. The one guy actually went back with his friends to sink a ferry. The Heroes of Telemark starring Kirk Douglas. Check it out if you want to see what I just said in action. Number six, the spy they didn't know they had. Another spy, but I spy spies. Not only did this dude fake his death for over 30 years, he was one of Britain's most crucial spies. He was so good, they didn't even know he was working for them. He was a veteran of the Spanish Civil War and loathed totalitarianism. He wanted to take dollar store Charlie Chaplin down. At the beginning of the war, Juan Pujol Garcia approached the British government about working as a spy against Germany for them. But he was rejected because he didn't have the credentials. So he just went ahead and did it anyway. On a flight from Madrid, he met some German officers and offered his services to spy against the British. They thought he lived in England. But the entire time, he was just living in Spain, feeding them false information. He just like pulled info from encyclopedias and advertisements to make them seem more legit. And he made mistakes like saying the Scots loved wine and the Germans still believed him. <laughs> exactly, Scots loving wine, no way. He invented over 27 informants and spies that he received information from, therefore making him kind of like invaluable. He eventually approached Britain again to apply for the job he was already doing. They of course hired him and were like, dude, what? What? Okay, sure. Garcia also played a key role in D-Day by telling the Germans the plan was fake, causing them to be unprepared for the day. After the war, he faked his own death until he was tracked down in the 1980s by a writer who was interested in telling his story and was like, I don't think this guy's dead, and then like went off and found him. That also should be a movie. Number five, Sisyphus. Oh baby, do I feel this one. Story of my life, honestly, day late and a dollar short. Some of you folks at home may also share the same fate as me and this chiseled Greek man doomed for eternity. This one is also one of my favorites. Basically, Sisyphus was cheating the devil. Cheating death itself, actually. After sliming his way out of the underworld one too many times, Big Daddy Zeus had to intervene. Also, when I say I relate to him, it's not because I'm a trickster who cheats my demise or cheats the, the devil or, or Hades. I'll explain. So, after Sisyphus had done what he'd done, Zeus sentenced him to roll a giant boulder up a hill for eternity. When he gets to the top, she rolls back down to the bottom and he has to start all over again, every day for the rest of time. Not just life, for time. Sometimes in life it feels like you're on a grind and you work and work and work and sometimes you go right back to square one no matter how hard you work. That sucks and that can be exhausting, but never give up because Chetty ain't and neither should you. Number four, King Midas. The lesson in this one, folks, is to be careful what you wish for. King Midas was being granted a wish. He wished for anything I touch be turned to gold. Now, I'm not an economist because I already have too many jobs on the internet, but you can imagine how at today's rate of gold, how wealthy you would be. Sheesh. Yeah, gold was valuable back then, but now, wow, we will. So his wish was granted, and everything he touched turned to gold, which for a good couple hours must have been the most fun anyone has ever had ever. Dude was seeing drachma signs. However, this wealthy gift he had been given quickly turned into a curse or a burden. Everything he touched turned to gold. That included his food. Because of this, he starved. To fix this burden, he bathed in a river, and it said that's why gold can be found in that river. I wouldn't mind having that power myself, but if I made food gold, or even worse, what if I made my beer gold? The heart. The heart. Number three, Narcissus. This one's in the name. Basically, there was a guy named Narcissus, and he was gorgeous. Like George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Ryan Reynolds gorgeous. I'll just all put together. Oh. And he knew it, and he loved his image. Now, as a guy who goes on camera every day, naturally, you hate yourself. You hate your self-image. That's how it goes. Ask anyone here, they would tell you the same thing. But also, as someone who's on camera every day and funny from time to time, you kind of like yourself on camera, and you kind of like your self-image. It's a very strange relationship we have. However, no one is as bad as it comes to as narcissists. One day in the forest, he came across a body of water where he saw his reflection cast. And it was so handsome, so gorgeous, that he couldn't look away, ever. Hence the name Narcissist, or Narcissist. Or what most girls in high school find out what their boyfriends have, Narcissism. Ladies, let me know, have you ever dated someone who has Narcissism or looked in the mirror too long? Let me know, I'm curious. Number two, Medusa. 
I think a lot of people know this one. Medusa, the half beautiful lady, half head of snakes in her head and, and half monster thing with powers. Yes, I realize that was three halves and that doesn't add up, but you're talking to a guy who was voted class clown in the high school yearbook and not voted most likely to succeed in math. I just wouldn't. But she was the Gorgon monster who would turn men into stone. I, I, I do know that. If they looked into her eyes. That was until your boy Perseus showed up like Link with a mirror shield and gave her a taste of her own medicine. What's the lesson on this one? I'm not sure. Maybe it's don't be so sure of your abilities. Maybe it's seeing things through. Or maybe it's having an extensive knowledge of tactics from a late 90s Nintendo character. That you, you never know when you're gonna need that. You never know. I, I, I know that stuff. That can come in handy. Number one, Pandora's box. I know you guys know this one, but this one is so simple. At first glance, it's not about turning things into gold or weird snakehead ladies or giants rising from beneath the earth to fight each other. It's a box. Something ain't good in that box, but it's just a box. So don't open it. I'm gonna say it again because there's gonna be people in the comment section that are gonna say, but Chetty, because you said don't open it, that means I really wanna open it. Imagine I'm Robert De Niro telling you not to open it. Nope, no way. Nope, not gonna happen. Nope, null and void. Don't do it, don't do it. That's how you know I'm serious because I did a bad impression. Oh great, somebody open it. Yes, that's right, Pandora's box was opened and it said that all the evils of the world were released from the box. Good tale, good moral, but who the heck thought putting all those evil things in the world in the box was a great idea? Whatever happened to just having memento boxes? You know, you open up a thing, like this is the time I farted on camera, this is the time I went to the cottage, you know what I mean? Whatever happened to that? At number 10, 18 month winter. If you live anywhere that gets harsh winters, then you know how annoying that it can be. Living in Canada, we know that all too well, and I can personally say that I despise winter. It basically lasts six months out of the year. If a six month winter sounds bad, then imagine how horrible an 18 month winter would be. In 1536 BCE, winter lasted a whole 18 months. Based on archeological records, a thick dust veil and darkened skies caused temperatures to drop significantly significantly in Europe and parts of Asia. This created some pretty frosty summers and harsh winters for those living in the area at the time. It is believed that this was all caused by a volcanic eruption that shot dust particles into the air and they didn't dissipate for a long time. This phenomenon wasn't just a minor inconvenience to people though, and it greatly impacted the lives of many. It is believed that about a third of Europe's population was wiped out and death rates soared to about 90% in northern regions. Regions. It was quite the catastrophe. All right, number nine, Andrew Jackson. You know when you get so frustrated with someone, you just like take over and like do it yourself. You're like, come on. Just let me do it. Well, that's probably exactly what went through Andrew Jackson's brain when he was about to be assassinated because it was so poorly done. He survived two point blank assassination attempts by the same guy, seconds apart. It was a cold, wet day in January in 1835, and Richard Lawrence waited behind a pillar inside the Capitol Rotunda. The aging president was there to attend a funeral, of all things, and Lawrence wanted to add one more body. He leapt from behind the pillar and fired. A loud bang went off, but the powder failed to ignite. Fail number one, Andrew was not pleased. And despite his aging form he was using a cane, he went at him with said cane. Lawrence quickly grabbed another pistol and the same thing happened again, misfire. Wow, you got so close dude and you really messed that up. During the trial, it was confirmed that Lawrence was indeed insane and thought he was the true king of England. And according to him, the only thing standing in his way to achieving like true power was Andrew Jackson. At number eight, Boston Toffee Apple Tsunami. Imagine a great wave of sticky syrup flooding your town. What would you do? Run, hide, have a quick snack? Well, for people in Boston in 1915, they didn't have enough time to think about those things when the Boston Toffee Apple Tsunami happened. On January 15th, 1915, a 90-foot wide cast iron cask full of 2.5 million gallons of molasses suddenly exploded. The explosion caused a wall of molasses to shoot about 15 feet high at around 35 miles per hour. This sticky situation ended up destroying buildings, carried vehicles, and even drowned 
some people and their horses. It is said that the Boston toffee apple tsunami killed about 21 people and injured 150. As people started to come into the hospital after the incident, witnesses recalled the victims looking like toffee apples, which is where the name for the event came from. It took the city weeks to clean up the molasses, but even for years following the incident, people said that they could still smell the molasses in the air on a hot day. Number seven, the big package. Okay, so technically this didn't happen, but it almost did. And the fact that it was even in the works, the fact that someone even thought of this and was like, yeah, that'll show the Russians. So ridiculous. No one really won the Cold War, but everyone has their perspective. But even today, the tensions between America and Russia are like pretty taut. Rather than all out trench warfare, the Cold War consisted of espionage and psychological warfare on both sides. The CIA had many plans, and one of them may surprise you. In the 1950s, Frank Wisner took over the OPC, the central part of the CIA. He sketched out the idea of how to really emasculate the Russians. Under his leadership, they drafted out a plan to drop massive condoms labeled medium to make them think that the US was superior to them, all based on the size of their John Thomases. Because when it comes to deciding whether or not to nuke another country, size matters. They would make the Russians bow to their superior sexual prowess of American men. Oh, sorry, I just almost knocked myself out with that eye roll. Whoa. Needless to say, the plan never came to fruition. At number six, rabbit army. Weird question, but if you had to choose one animal to fight an army of, which animal would you choose? Well, whatever you choose, make sure it's not rabbits, because as fun as you think an army of rabbits might be, apparently they can be quite fearsome. In 1807, after signing the treaties of Tils, Napoleon wanted to celebrate a bit and he wanted to organize a rabbit hunt. He asked his chief of staff to organize the hunt and apparently he went, way overboard with the bunnies. Instead of rounding up a couple dozen rabbits, this man said, oh, you want rabbits? All right, bet. And he got 3,000 rabbits. 3,000 rabbits! The rabbits were released into an open field for the hunt and people thought that they would just flee and run away. But instead, the rabbits ganged up on Napoleon and his crew and the bunnies charged at them. But don't worry, these bunnies didn't have a vengeance. They were just trying to make friends. You see, the chief of staff ended up getting tame farm rabbits and they were already used to humans, so they just wanted to say hi. But could you imagine those first few moments of having 3,000 rabbits chasing after you? Number five, gymnastics. Imagine being the first guy to ever do a backflip. Imagine being the first guy to ever see a backflip. I think that's more of a spectacle, if anything. Gymnastics were developed around 500 BCE. Ancient Greeks loved parkour, apparently. Who'd have thunk? Once the Romans invaded Greece, the Roman army made it a point to study gymnastics. They needed their soldiers to be quick, light, versatile, and flexible. Anything that makes them more terrifying, really, that's the better. Those moves were so dazzling that the Olympics had to include gymnastics as a sport. But once the games were outlawed in 939 AD, the gymnastics game almost, almost came to an end. Once the 1800s rolled around, we saw the return of tuck jumps and straddle sits. Thank God, we almost lost it. We were so, we were so close. German doctors Johann Friedrich Gutsmith and Friedrich Ludwig Jahn, they changed the athletic game forever when they created these new exercise routines for young men, including the pummel horse, balance beam, vaulting horse, horizontal bar, you name it, those things that we do when we work, you know, when we work out every day. Chris is like, yep, I do all those every morning. These doctors wanted to see some flips. They got flips, my friend. Number four, boxing. Straightforward and simple. This ancient sport is depicted from hieroglyphics in tombs of Egypt all the way to the wall carvings of ancient Sumer. One of the oldest sports events known to man, boxing has made a place to stay in history for the last 5,000 years. The Greeks made this form of brutality into a spectacle by wrapping their hands with leather straps lined with metal to either knock their opponents unconscious or even death. Oh, oh okay, you wrap that under. Okay, how do you play ref? Oh, you just punch each other right in the face until there's just one of us. Got it. Weighing in at 145 pounds with a reach across of 71 inches in the blue trunks, Patroclus Angelopoulos. No mouth guards, no rounds, just punchy punchy and sleepy sleepy. I don't know why I'm still doing this voice. I don't know. <laughs> Number three, Viking hockey. Being a Canadian and all, this one, oh, this one hit, this one hurt. Buckle up lads, turns out Canadians did not invent hockey. Yeah, we found out during Canada's 150th celebration of all times. We're like, 
What? Yeah, they found out hockey wasn't so Canadian after all. It was Vikings. Who knew? They actually brought it here in the first place. They also didn't call it hockey either. They called it a way better name. Slap Fatten. Go slap some fat around with the boys. Oh yeah, me and the boys are gonna grab some Timmies and go play some road slap fatten. Yeah, it's, instead of yelling car, they just yell R, and then they keep playing. They're like, no, turn around, go back, slap some fat in your car. Vikings would gather sticks and of course some fat, and then they would slap them in between two posts. They would just make two posts. Here or here, doesn't matter. They'd make the rules up. Imagine getting cross-checked by a Viking. See you later, chest plate. Non-existent anymore. Offside. Number two, long jump. The long jump, originating in 656 Greece, was an Olympic sport consisting of simply hurling your body over a vast distance of horizontal space. Usually these spaces would include streams, bogs, or ravines. This ancient sport differs from the modern long jump, of course, just a tad. And of course, long jump wouldn't be long jump without the flute music. That's right, this sport was always accompanied by a flutist since music was a very important part of the spectacle of the ancient Olympic Games. Hey man, can you play Jump by Van Halen? Just kind of gets, no? Okay, you don't know that one? No worries. Back then the Olympians would hold weights in both of their hands, either one, two, or five kilogram carved stones, almost like kettlebells to help them swing momentum after their initial run up. I love that the times are either something really safe and fun like swimming or jumping, and then you're like standing next to an athlete during the anthem whose job it is to literally break people. Uh, yeah, I'm a jumper. Oh, you're a fighter. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I jump. So, nice man. Break a leg out there. No, 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 it's not what I meant. And finally, number one, no rules football. Personal favorite, always gotta bring this one up. This is so scary. I've never played a game of rugby. I don't even know, I don't want any part of this. Sport fans are a bit much. I'll start by saying that. The whole yelling at the TV thing, Unless I'm seeing the Green Goblin, I'm not yelling at any TV screen ever, period. But sportsmanship goes back, way back. Football was also a lot different in the late 12th century. See, instead of quarter kicks and throw-ins, you could do anything you wanted to retrieve said ball from the opposing team. Anything, like, you know, what we were mentioning earlier, you can just do that and just knock someone out and take their stuff. Also, there's no limit to how many players you had on your side. You can grab thousands, hundreds, whatever, you name it. It would be town versus town. It was hilarious. They called this a sport. But finally, come 1314, King Edward II banned the game. Obviously, people were dying for no reason. The only time diving was allowed was back in this game. I can, that's acceptable. When you would get kicked in the neck by a knight on a horse, more than fair. I'd say stay down if I were you, for sure. I would act, I'd be like, oh, my neck, what? See ya. Two minutes in, I'm out of the game. I can't even play football today, let alone football in the dark ages. What a joke. My back already hurts from this. Number 10, hotel speed. Okay, picture this. You're young and in a hotel with your parents. Maybe it's a vacation, maybe it's a trip, or maybe it's a hockey game, nice. Nonetheless, you find yourself in a long hallway with a strange looking carpet. Hotel hallways always have weird carpets, I don't know. Maybe it's the giant hamburger and milkshake you just ate. Maybe it's the hotel TV or the excitement of just not being at home. But something has changed. You're different. Your powers have been amplified. For this corridor will be your personal racetrack. A shame Guinness World Records isn't here to clock you in at max speed because for some reason if you fly down that hallway any faster, the rug would catch fire. Yes, the joys of running down a hotel hallway. This is probably how the first Olympians felt at the first Olympic Games. I'm comparing it to that for some reason, sure we'll go with it. Where the only event at these Olympic Games was running. Like many of the other events that would later come later on, this was done without clothing, which is fine. As long as you're, you know, not doing that in the hotel hallway. Keep clothes on. Number nine, WWE, brother. Only if you could have seen the look on my face when I discovered that wrestling in the WWE isn't as real as I thought it was. The shock, the confusion, and the loud ringing in my ear. It really, it was pretty serious for me. I got really into it as a kid. It gave me some Vietnam flashbacks, seriously. You mean to tell me that there was an intricate planning into every hit and fall, every entrance, and every time we heard the sound of a steel chair connecting with someone's forehead? Oh man. As a kid, I never would have guessed that, but when The Undertaker walks in a room, you take notice. Those thoughts just go away. Sadly, the ancient Greeks did not have cage matches, turnbuckles, or personas based on hyper male confidence. What they did have, however, was some real wrestling, some bare knuckle, no clothes, oiled up kind of wrestling. Nice. 
Instead of a one leg up pin, a scoring system was used for when the opponent's body was on the ground. And I'm sure lots of people got injured in the process. Whew, no thanks. I'll stick to the cage matches. Number 8. Pank Ration Here's another story for you. It might seem kind of silly, but growing up, I got to witness the birth of a mainstream sport. The UFC got its start in the early 90s, but blew up in the mid 2000s. Now, I'm not much of a sports guy. Besides major championship matches or games, I don't really watch any sports. I'm more of a film and video game guy, if you couldn't tell. However, my first interaction with the UFC was seeing an octagon shaped ring, and my grade 2 geometry immediately kicked in and said, that, that's an octagon. Wow, okay, that's different. However, the second thing that I noticed is that this was not wrestling, and this wasn't boxing. It was kind of a mixture of both. Sort of a mixed martial art, if you will. Well, that's kind of what Pank Ration was. There was no indirect punching or kicking, but pretty much anything else goes. To me, this sounds like a good way to get injured. Kind of like wrestling before, now it's just even worse. And as I'm sure you all know, paper cuts can be lethal back then, so maybe not such a good idea. Did I mention this is done without clothes too? There's, everyone's, everyone's naked. Number 7. The Road Trip This isn't an Olympic event, but honestly, it should have been. Think about it for a minute. I want you guys to look out the nearest window right now. Get up, go ahead, look out the nearest window. Tell me what you see. You probably see a road with cars. When you need a fast food fix, it's as simple as getting in a car and driving on the road to your destination. Or getting it delivered with your favorite food delivery app. It's 2022, we can do a lot of crazy stuff now. What I'm getting at is that people from all over the Greek city states came to Olympia to witness the first Olympics. Except, you know, it would have been a triathlon just to get there. Frankly, my biggest fear, walking. That was the main mode of transportation, which after a while in those sandals was probably hell. Imagine trekking many, many miles by land and sea to only be exhausted to watch athletes become exhausted. Oh, I need some water just thinking about it. Woo. Number six, peace. Peace. What's better than a good war? A better armistice, or at least I'd like to hope so. During these first Olympic Games, which on a side note, if I had a time machine and a scooter, I'd love to see firsthand. There was people and athletes coming from all corners of Hellenistic civilization, all Greek states and colonies. Well, sometimes these Greek states got caught up in these little things called wars. Who knew, right? But when the Olympics were on, a truce was called. Messengers were dispatched to announce the truce, which gave all the people traveling on their long treks safe passage. I also find it somewhat amusing that they did this all for one day. That's right, the events only lasted one day. Some folks did days of traveling only to have it all be over in 24 hours. The opening ceremony couldn't have taken that long either, so I feel like it's kind of a waste of time. Only if we got some of that peace right now. Russia is looking at Ukraine a certain kind of way, just, just waiting to act up. Bad Russia, stay in your corner. Number five, the Reformation. As if Europe wasn't already going through it, how about a little bit of religious civil war? In 1521, Augustinian monk Martin Luther wrote his 95 Theses, basically accusing the Catholic Church of corruption. Most heresies at the time were quietly smothered, but this one was a bit more of a problem thanks to Frederick III of Saxony protecting Luther and bringing about the Reformation. Some may say that this isn't exactly a bad thing, and I feel like people believing whatever they want should be perfectly fine, but at the time, Lutheranism got political and was an awesome excuse to confiscate the Catholic Church's land holdings in Central Europe and Scandinavia, making their rulers rich and giving them enough money to oppose Habsburg dominance. So yeah, sounds totally awesome. Number 4. Witch Trials Do you know what else the Reformation did for the world? It successfully brought witch hunting to Central Europe for 200 years! Yay! What's a good way to get rid of anyone who does some stuff you can't explain, don't like, or consider unholy? Accuse them of witchcraft. Oh, they won't admit to being a witch? Hmm, let's deprive them of sleep and do heinous things to them until they admit it because that must make it true. This all really kicked off in 1486 when Heinrich Kramer wrote The Hammer of Witches, which basically said, Witchcraft's getting bad, we should step up the punishments. Which is pretty bad when you know that, not too much later, enlightenment rationalism became a thing, which basically denied the existence of magic and therefore witches and witchcraft. Number three, burning Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc, the patron saint of France. She claimed she was the prophesied savior of France. She led an army to save the besieged city of Orleans, and she helped to see the prince at the time crowned as King Charles VII. What did she get in return for all this? 
She was captured by the Anglo Burgundians and put on trial for 70 different charges, including witchcraft, heresy, and dressing like a man. And after a year of captivity, she was forced to sign a confession that she had never received divine guidance like she had claimed. If all that wasn't bad enough, on the 30th of May in 1431, at the age of 19, she was burned at the stake in the marketplace of Rouen. Luckily, 20 years after her death, Charles VII would get her name cleared, and in 1902, Pope Benedict XV canonized her. Number 2. Pirates While Europe wasn't exactly a very stable place, it was an incredibly wealthy place. And where there is wealth, there are people who make it their goal to forcefully take that wealth. That's right, pirates. North African pirates frequently targeted Catholic Italy, Spain, and Malta in search of captives to sell in Ottoman markets. Herodin Barbarossa and his brother Ursa Ali achieved notoriety in the Mediterranean for sacking the Balearic Islands, robbing Spanish treasure ships, and successfully attacking southern Italy. Christian states such as the Knights of Malta also captured people by raiding Muslim shipping routes and ports. None of this was particularly great for anyone. Captured men were held for ransom or used and sold as labor. Labor, but as always seems to be the case, and as I'm sure you can imagine, captured women got the worst of it. Number 1. The Bubonic Plague To top our lovely list of happenings, we have a lovely little thing called the Bubonic Plague. The Black Death ran rampant all over Europe, being carried on fleas that traveled on rodents from roughly 1350 to 1450. This wasn't anything like the pandemic we're dealing with today. This sickness was almost always fatal, and it took out like half of the population of Europe. Since the disease was worse in big cities, which makes sense, the best solution was to move out into the country. That's great, but the only people that could do that were the ones who were wealthy enough to afford it. As you can imagine, the massive loss of life did not bode too well for the economy either. A huge chunk of consumer population just didn't exist anymore. After the plague had pretty much gone away, there was a steep rise in population, think like baby boomers, and that helped bring things back to normal. Number 10. The Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as Traite de Verdun, was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire, and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom, and Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child. This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make Make every shot miss easily. I would just float near the net, tap the ball away. Like, nice try. Mm. Back to prison. Mm. Number eight. Stone masonry. So we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? 
Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stonemasons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This was like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, Hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those. What are these? Eh, yeah, backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the, I got it. We're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff and growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services, especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs who were laborers who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain a good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on, a three day work week? Plant a couple carrots here and there? Eh, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, Mad Jack. During World War II, you needed all the power you could get, but one man, Lieutenant Colonel Jack Churchill, AKA Mad Jack, had a different mindset when it came to battle and weaponry. He believed any British soldier going into battle without using a sword was improperly dressed. Also, fun fact about Mad Jack Churchill, he represented Great Britain in the World Archery Championship, so not only did he have a sword, but he also went into battle with a longbow, like he's Hawkeye. History has acknowledged Mad Jack as the last man to take out an enemy in combat with a longbow. That is a pretty wild achievement to have. But here's the most intimidating part about all this, if for some reason you're still not impressed. Before combat, right before, Mad Jack would play the bagpipes before drawing his sword and running into battle. That is the most badass thing I've ever heard. Imagine hearing bagpipes just coming from afar and then just hearing arrows flying in. I'd give up, here's the white flag. You earned it, Mad Jack, see ya. Number four, bat bombs. This sounds fake, but it is indeed true. Apparently bombs, artillery, tanks, were no longer like the in way to decimate your enemies. A dude in the United States thought he had a batter idea. Bat bombs were an experimental weapon developed in World War II, which was exactly as it sounds. The idea was that bats with bombs 
attached to them would swoop in behind enemy lines and decimate the enemy. Who was the genius behind this idea? A man by the name of Lytle S. Adams. And he was a dentist from Pennsylvania. The 60 year old tooth fairy was driving home from vacation when suddenly he was bombarded with brilliance. He witnessed thousands of bats exit the Carlsbad caves and when he heard about Pearl Harbor, he began planning. These tiny flying mammals could be connected to tiny time fused incendiary bombs and then released to land on the enemy. Just two months after Pearl Harbor, he presented the idea to the White House along with his oddball team. A pilot turned actor, an ex-gangster, and an ex-hotel manager to name a few. The project was greenlit, however the project was abandoned in 1943 due to the development of nuclear bombs. Number 3. Reindeer on a Sub June 1941, the Germans were attacking the Soviet Union. It was one of the biggest attacks in history, and Britain and US had to send weapons, supplies, anything really, just to keep them afloat, just to keep them in the fight. They sent these supplies through the Arctic Circle, that was the only route, but of course it was littered with U-boats. Thankfully the British HMS Trident was there to watch the waters, and in turn the Soviets were able to fight on. So as a gift, as a thank you, the Soviets sent the captain of the Trident, the World War II submarine, a gift. They sent him a live reindeer. Six foot, real life reindeer. And the British had to accept because it was ill-mannered if they didn't. So they had to keep a six foot tall real reindeer on a submarine. A World War II submarine, not even like a bigger, nicer one, just a little underwater. Her name was Pollyanna and they brought her on board through a torpedo tube. She was a crew member for six weeks. She slept better than most as well. She actually shared her room in the captain's quarters. Imagine the smell. Mm. Finally, the Trident returned home to Britain and our leading lady was donated to the Regent's Park Zoo. All right, number two, the big dump. Like it or not, we've all been that person. The one to leave the bathroom a little more violent than he loved it. But I can't imagine anyone else in history of the world feeling more guilty than the one who sank a U-boat with his dump. That's right. Apparently it's not so easy relieving yourself miles below the ocean in a submarine. German U-boats had a two valve system that only worked during shallow dives. But if you have a torpedo to drop of your own, time isn't always on your side. On April 14th, 1945, while 200 feet below, an unknown dumper caused a toilet malfunction, causing sewage and salt water to flood the compartment. The circuitry got fried, releasing chlorine gas, so they had to resurface. But when they did, they were spotted by the Brits and were attacked. Four of the crewmen died and the rest were captured, which I guess is how the story caught on. Imagine being the dude who dumped so hard he sunk a U-boat. And finally coming in at number one, Diamond Heist. Now most of these sound like movies, some of them are in fact already movies. This last one is absolutely insane. It should be a musical or something. It happened around May 1940 when Colonel Montague, nicknamed Monty, he was an undercover agent working for MI6. And when Germany was invading Amsterdam, he knew that big guns would eventually want to steal an extremely valuable amount of diamonds. So Monty, the quick thinker that he was, stole them first. You know, to keep him safe and to also look cool. He had gotten a key to the entrance of the Amsterdam diamond market, like literally he had a key, like it's Legend of Zelda, and then traveled to the building in regular human ordinary clothes, broke in, but he didn't know the code to the vault. He was looking back on past clues that he had acquired and he was working on getting in for about 24 hours straight. He literally heard Germans around the building and he got in the vault just in time. He completed his diamond heist, traveled all the way to England, and turned the diamonds over to the Dutch government. Which is something I'm sure not all of us would do, so amen Monty, killing it. Number 10, shin kicking. I mean, it's literally exactly what you think. You kick each other in the shins, a lot. Like over and over again. An early 17th century form of martial arts originating in England, obviously. This combat sport is a very simple one. Hold on to the opponent's collars to become close, and then kick the absolute out of each other's shins. Athletes would stuff their trousers with hay for extra cushioning and specifically design their boots to be stronger and more rigid. First one to fall or give up loses. Dude, I woke up this morning and cranked my pinky toe off the door. I literally almost blacked out. I don't know how these guys did it. Alcohol was forbidden before the game as well, which was loosely regarded. Yeah, obviously, I'm about to snap my tibia and fibula off someone's Doc Martens. I'm slamming a couple Guinnesses before. Number nine, cherry racing. Look, I'm still a new driver. Left hand turns, they freaked me out. I couldn't imagine chariot racing in any direction, even straight, no thank you. How do you even signal? Maybe, I don't know. Back in 700 BC, chariot races were like NASCAR. It was fast, 
it was loud, and it was dangerous. These events were held in arenas, like our modern forms of entertainment, and 10 chariots would race at the same time. It was chaos, it was a lot of dudes just flew out, it was nonsense. With tight turns and dust filling the air, it really was a spectacle. Horses were part of the Olympics come 684 BC. Four horse chariot races were being held in Olympia. You could have seen this. And then you watch the guy jogging and you're like, oh, I, I like that event more. It's a bit more loud, I like that one. The riders, they were brave souls, man. The ropes were often attached to the riders' wrists so that if they went overboard, they immediately, it was bad news for them, they were toast. Nobody's going out easy in the Colosseum, even when there's horses and nice things involved. Number eight, marathon running. We all know those runners who are up at five and get their mile. Who likes this stuff, man? Well, apparently the ancient Greek messenger Phidippides did. In fact, it was his job. Yeah, this guy would just like run place to place telling people stuff. The 42 kilometer foot race originating just shortly after the huge battle of Marathon. Ah, this is in fact where the sport gets its name from. Basically a bunch of guys showed up early and Buddy was like, yeah, you gotta run as fast as you possibly can from Marathon to Sparta and warn them. But that's like 42.195 kilometers away. Exactly! Remember, and run as fast as you can. No water belt, no gel packs, just panic and blisters. This Olympic sport needs no introduction. Just put some shoes on and go for a run yourself. Next time you're halfway through your warm up on the elliptical, just imagine the summer of 490 BC. Wouldn't it just been easier to just text them that they're coming? They are coming. Scene. Oh, okay, that was, that was real easy, thanks. Number seven, fisherman's joust. Not to be confused with fisherman's friend, although that's also quite as intense. Fisherman's jousting or water jousting was a combat sport originated in ancient Egypt. Yeah, it goes way back. They invented beauty and also water jousting. That's pretty amazing, we love it. Keeping it, keeping it balanced. Each vessel would have a few players, players, he says, and using one long pole per aquatic team, they have to poke and push the other players out of their vessel into the water. I'm pretty sure Kyle and I did this growing up with pool noodles. We'd ride inflatable alligators and just smack each other. We didn't even poke, it's like the loose noodle, right in the neck too, is the worst. You dip it, good night, that's it, you're off that alligator. Now, of course, it wasn't a spectacle like it was in ancient Egyptian days, but also may have not have been a game, turns out, yeah. Historians are still scratching their heads over this ancient hieroglyphic that appears to depict water jousting. Was this a fun pastime or was this naval combat over fishing territory? For us, it was definitely the latter. It was for sure the latter. I was like, this is my pond, dude. Get out of here. Number six, pancreation. This vicious ancient Greek contest combines punching, kicking, and wrestling for an all out physical combat. A mix of martial arts. Dude, this is literally UFC. And the tail of the tape. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's fight! Big John McCarthy, of course, commentator on this fight tonight. Coming to you live from Las Vegas. This is literally UFC, people. You win by either knocking your opponent unconscious or by making them give up. Buddy, Patroclus has me in a flying armbar. I'm letting all of Greece down with that tap. Okay, okay! Much like modern day combat rules, there was no biting allowed or eye gouging. I can't stop thinking about not only the brutality of the fighters themselves, but the fans. Thousands of years of crowds showing up to chant and cheer on their favorite warrior. Just a spinning axe kick another right in the face. I love it. Number five, best man origins. I got asked to be a best man recently, so you know what? I have to share some, some, some love. I have to share some ancient best man love. It was a little different back then, that's for sure. Back in those days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom. That's normal, whether that's a brother or a best friend. Back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different, and it was all about protecting one's assets rather than, you know, anything to do with love. Back then, bride kidnapping was so common that if there was somebody else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to send someone else, they might try and steal her for themselves, right? It's awful. That's where the best man comes in. He's got to watch for dudes hopping fences ready to steal your wife and run away. The best man's job was to protect the bride at all costs. And if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. That's wild. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure she didn't try and make a run for it as well. It sounds okay at first and then you're like, oh no, it's all horrible. History, of course. Number four, ancient divorce. Eh, it happens sometimes. Weird, almost like those marriages I just uh, explained wouldn't work out all the time. 
Weird. Trial by combat. You've probably heard of this, right? We've all seen that Game of Thrones episode. The eyes and the... Huh. Yeah, that's a good one. That was the norm, right? You fight for your freedom. But what about divorce by combat? You ever heard of this? If you and your significant other weren't getting along back in the dark ages, instead of dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork, instead, you would battle each other in front of a crowd because why not? It's the medieval times. It was an organized event that included restrictions for the husband. Now, it's pretty hilarious to think back on, but the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back, while the wife, soon to be happy ex-wife, ran around in circles around said hole, also carrying a sack full of rocks, hitting the ex-husband with the rocks the whole time. Yeah, pretty intense and also pretty hilarious to think of. Yeah, that's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot. Get out of here. A sack of rocks? Just take the castle, take the horse. I don't care, I'm out. I'll sign anything. I'll stamp anything. Number three, the battle of the stray dog. Okay, now we're gonna go back into some weird battles that we probably missed in school. I grew up with dogs my whole life, okay? It's stressful at times. You open the door for a second and all of a sudden your furry friends are running down the street after a blue jay and your heart's racing. Since the second Balkan war in the early 1900s, Greece and Bulgaria were going head to head, right? At this point, there was a lot of conflict, a lot of emotions, tensions were of course high. But come October 1925, things finally escalated even more. A Greek soldier was chasing after his dog, who just decided to bolt randomly. But in doing so, he accidentally crossed the border into Bulgaria. So he was shot at, right? It was scary. The Greeks at that point were beyond upset, so they marched into Bulgaria and soon began a full-on war. All because of this dog who saw a blue jay probably. By the time the international committee negotiated a ceasefire to clear up the obvious misunderstanding, 50 people had already lost their lives. So yeah, keep those leashes on, please, unless you're in a off-leash dog park. Cause you might start a war, you never know. Number two, the Battle of Los Angeles. Of course I have to mention this battle. This one's a little bit different, but you know, maybe some UFO stuff going on here. The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great LA Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February, 1942. This event, first of all, it took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack. So yeah, everybody was of course immensely stressed out at this point. And then something like 25 enemy aircraft was then spotted flying over LA in the late hours of February 24th. So now everyone's freaking out. Air raids went off, blackouts were in effect. This was not a drill, right? Right? Artillery fire, machine guns, anti-aircraft shells. In total, around 1,400 shells were all fired off. Two people had heart attacks. Five people died in total from this retaliation. And it was all a false alarm. Yep. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. Yeah, huh, oops. Thought I heard a noise, my bad, we'll just close that. No one touches anymore, I guess. War nerves. And finally, number one, Battle of Zappolino. This one is pretty epic, okay. All over a bucket. Turning the calendars back to 1325, the Battle of Zappolino, it was a large scale event all over a tiny bucket. And no, I'm not joking. The War of the Oaken Bucket. Now this war consisted of two Italian towns, Bologna and Medina. Now it all kicked off when soldiers from Medina snuck into Bologna with intentions to steal. To steal the wooden bucket from the city's well. Right? Resources were sparse back then, of course, so the Bolognese declared war, and then they sent in an invading force of 30,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 cavaliers. The city of Modena had a smaller army. They had 500 infantrymen and only 2,000 cavalry forces. But the thing is, those guys still won. They chased the larger army back to Bologna while destroying towns in the process. Now, some recall them bringing the bucket back just to taunt the city, but right now the bucket is currently on display still in Modena. So it ended up finding its forever home there. And you can go check it out if you want. That many people kicked the bucket over this bucket. History is strange, my friend. Kicking off the list at number 10, Arthur Conan Doyle, the psychic. We love psychics. In 1912, Arthur Conan Doyle, who you may know as the author of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, did some sleuthing through time and space. Yeah, you heard me. He wrote a story called Danger, which revolved around the fictional nation of Norland attacking Britain. Norland starved Britain into submission throughout the use of submarines. Now the story overall describes a need for some kind of tunnel, otherwise Britain would fall. This story sparked public discourse, though there were skeptics 
such as Admiral of Sisi Penrose Fitzgerald, who wrote, I myself do not think that any civilized nation will torpedo unarmed and defenseless merchant ships. Alas, World War I arrived, and he would home eat his words. On February 18th, 1915, Germany announced that every British merchant ship entering the British waters would be destroyed. Then in May 1915, the transatlantic linear Lusitania was torpedoed on its way to Britain, and 1,200 people died. Needless to say, it was a tragedy, of course, but it's interesting that Norlin sounds a lot like Germany, and his story was released before the war even started. That's wild. He's like a Nostradamus. He like predicted his own, I think the Simpsons, you predict the uh, real life stuff in their episodes. He kind of did that. Number nine, Mata Hari, the 27 year old Dutch dancer who became a spy. You heard me. Born in 1876, Mata Hari, real name Margaretha Zell, married an army captain when she was 18 years old. Now, the marriage was horrible. This guy was violent. Oh, I'm sorry. It didn't work, obviously. So, Mata Hari, she split. She hit the road and decided she wanted to live like a colorful butterfly in the sun. But just what does that entail? Well, at age 27, Mata moved to Paris and reinvented herself as an artiste. She tapped into her Dutch roots and started performing dance acts under the alias Lady Gresha McLeod. She was the first dancer to go nude. It was a big deal. Her show, of course, got packed. She was the talk of many towns, and for years she would travel to Europe and perform to these sold out crowds. But the most important factor here is the guys who would come out and watch. These military officers and aristocrats would give her gifts, anything they could. They loved her. And she loved moving around and dating these men. She was living her best life. Around 1914, she was a little older, around 40 years old, so the knees were starting to feel it, and also um, the war broke out. So that's a lot to deal with. Hari ended up being sent back to Holland at this point, was later approached by Karl Kromer, the German counsel in Amsterdam, because the men she was in contact with were considered a valuable asset. So she went from being a dancer to a spy. Code name H21. Number eight. Dr. Doolittle. Now it's time for a game called Let's Make Taylor Cry. Let's do it. The origin of Dr. Doolittle, with exception, this one does actually make sense. See, war is no place for kids, obviously. Even if they love battleships, boats, planes, whatever the case may be, it's no place for kids. Author Hugh Lofting promised that he would tell his children what it was like fighting in the war. However, the world of warfare entirely changed and introduced an entirely new horror, trench warfare. So instead, he came up with the character of Dr. Doolittle, a physician in the trenches who could, well, you guessed it, talk to animals. Not only did the stories delight his children, but they also kept the spirits of his fellow soldiers up. I didn't know this. This is very amazing. This is emotional. One soldier even said that his story saved his sanity whilst in the trenches. Hugh himself was a very shy, recluse man, and he found his voice through Doolittle, who could do the things that he could not. Throughout his life, Lofting suffered through mental illness and the death of his loved ones, but it was always his love for his family and animals, of course, that brought him back. Number seven. Adrian Cotton de Watt. I love this guy. I actually need to know this one. Sorry. Over the course of six decades and four wars, Lieutenant General Adrian Cotton de Watt, I have to say it like that, sorry, survived the impossible multiple times. He considered one of the most dedicated soldiers of all time because, for starters, after he lost his left hand, and his left eye, Adrian did not retire. In fact, the British Army officer went on to experience 10 more horrible injuries. As World War I broke out in November 1914, Carton was serving. He was opposing the forces of the Dervish state. In doing so, he was shot in the arm and face, and that's how he lost his left eye. But a grim detail shared by Lord Ismay, who served alongside the soldier, said in 1964 that the doctor at the time couldn't do anything about his eye, so he must have been in pure agony. I didn't know that. Poor guy. But also, he's such a badass. Lord Ismay continues to believe that losing his eye was a blessing in disguise, because the incident allowed for Adrian to relocate to Europe, where even more action was waiting for him. Once stationed in Europe, Adrian received more gunshot wounds in the head, hand, stomach, groin, leg, and ankle, all hit by bullets. And if that's not inspiring enough, he survived numerous plane crashes and a broken back? I didn't know that! If you, what? If you feel like reading more incredible details about the soldier and diplomat, there's a book on his whole life. I'm gonna read it. It's on my list. I love this stuff, man. Number six, USS Cyclops, the ghost ship of World War One. I'm in. The mystery of the USS Cyclops is one that continues to boggle minds all over the world. The USS Cyclops was the first of four class ships built for the United States Navy preceding World War I, but either on or shortly after March 4th, 1918, the ship entirely disappeared along with a crew of 306 people. Poof, gone. Now, when I say what it was near, you'll probably throw your head back and be like, ah, I get it, gotcha now. Now it makes sense. They disappeared in the area known as the Bermuda Triangle. 
Yeah. But still, a ship of that size disappearing without a single trace? The Bermuda Triangle had its work cut out for her. She knew what she was doing from the get-go. To this day, it remains one of the single largest loss of life in the US naval history, not involving combat, of course. She was also carrying 10,800 tons of manganese ore used for munitions, so it was theorized that she was sunk by a German U-boat. But to this day, the fate of the ship remains unknown. Bermuda Triangle, phone home, let's go, let's talk. We got some questions. Number five, tanks. Okay, so after a few Olympics, people got tired of walking those many, many miles just to see some dudes run a mile. We need more events, said the Olympic organizers, but what? We have athletes running, what else is there? Okay, okay, I hear you. What if we get athletes to run, but with full military armor and gear on? Yeah, that's right. There was another race where athletes would wield the armor of the Greek soldiers and race. I can imagine that there was a clunking noise, or at least a lot of it, and also how difficult it must be to run in bronze armor. I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. Come a little closer. A little closer. A little closer. Whoa, too close. Bronze armor isn't good for chafing. Cause let me tell you something, hot Mediterranean sun, not a lot of water, and running in hot metal attire? Someone's gonna have to come over and put baby powder on my bum bum. Number four, the classic. I don't know why, but when I think of ancient Greeks, I think of grapes on the vine, marble, chariots, and, and the movie 300. It's, it's kind of hard to forget those spray on abs. Although someone could put them on me, kind of nice. Equestrian events were another event of the ancient Greek Olympics, and I have something nice to say about something for once. While every other event was dominated by males, because, well, only males were allowed to compete, of course, the equestrian events allowed women. Nice! And naturally, ladies, when someone points the spotlight on you, you shine. A notable winner of the event was Sinisica, a Spartan princess and athlete who was an excellent horse breeder. I guess that's a nice thing to be remembered by. According to some records, two monuments were built in honor of her victory. I rode a horse once. I can firmly say that I prefer the automobile. Just saying. You walk around like that, that's why all the cowboys walk like this. You just do that, all that. Number three, the long jump. After running and running in armor, it was discovered that jumping makes for a great Olympic event. How high, how far? It's simple, really. It should come as no surprise that I did not perform well in that section of track and field day at school. To my disadvantage, there was no strength-based events because it was considered unhealthy for us because we were so young. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. My counter to that argument would be, why are you making tubby kids run the 1500 meter? That's liable to have the kid with asthma writing his math test in the hospital bed later. I'd probably be joining him. However, I am a supporter of the Ancient Greek jumping event. Basically, athletes gotta jump as far as they can whilst holding two large rocks. Now, if we did that today, people would know what it's like to do a long jump when grandma feeds you too much. Yeah, it's not easy. Number two, the discus, the javelin, and the hammer. Sounds like a good band. Hey, these are all events that we still compete in today. That's awesome. But doesn't it make you nervous when the athletes are throwing those bad boys around? Especially the hammer throw. God, it just makes me so nervous. While I couldn't find an exact example of an accident happening, I doubt the ancient Greeks had safety in mind for spectators. The discus was made from stone or bronze, and they were tossing those suckers the same way Guy Fieri tosses Caesar salad which is a lot because he's kind of a big guy too. However, for me, it's the javelin that's most terrifying as that was an appropriate weapon of war for the time. And athletes are just throwing them around like it's nothing. You're telling me the crowd was a safe distance away from the splash zone? Yeah, just keep your eye on the sky to be safe, folks. I don't know about that. Number one, rap battle. Honestly, this is something we should bring back to the Olympics. While I was complaining about not being able to compete in strength-based events earlier, I, as a theater kid, would have much preferred some of the other less intensive events the ancient Greeks had up to offer. The ancient Greeks were not just chucking stones and chafing in bronze armor. There was also a competition with the arts, poetry, song, and singing. Imagine if America entered Eminem into a rap battle contest. There would be no contest. Imagine if Canada entered one for musicians. KD Lang, Celine Dion, oh, and Anne Murray, just singing angels. Yeah.